You and you and you and you, you've got a president now. He gave the land a new deal. You hold the cards, now you deal. You and you and you and you put shoulders to the plow. He gave us what we asked for, now pay him back somehow. Step out in front. Get back of the president. And give a man a job. He bore the brunt. Now bear with the president. And give a man a job. If the old name of Roosevelt makes the old heart proud, you take this message straight from the president and give a man a job. You look like a banker who drives your car. I drive it myself, sir. Have a cigar. Keep your cigar and hire a chauffeur and keep a man from becoming a loafer. You look like a grocer. No, sir. My job's extermination. You must give your assistants each a nice weekend vacation. And I'll need more men to kill the rats. We want you to hire a crowd. You'll do good work if you hang out this sign. It means no rats allowed. What's the matter with you? I'm a very sick woman. Oh, a hypochondriac. You must get a doctor for pneumonia, a doctor for insomnia, one for osmosis and two for halitosis, one for amenia and one for eczema, neuritis, bronchitis, flea pitis, St. Vitus, or any other kind of anitis. That will delight us. You must get a doctor for every disease you've got. And that way, it'll give you lots of enjoyment. And in that way, madam, you will have to end unemployment. Now listen to me, everybody. Step out in front. Get back at the, get back at the president and give a man a job. You know he bought a front. You know that. I know it. So step out and give a man a job. You know who's in back of this in the NRA? No? Well, I'll tell you. And when I do, it'll give you heart of trouble. from the president and get a man Closing time. The close of an era. The great big spree, the jazz age, is over, all over. In the 1920s, the great American word was prosperity. Now the 30s have begun and there is a new word, depression. Little man, what now? Well, you can always sell surplus apples, five cents a piece on the street corner. And if you're bewildered, panicky at what's happening to you and your country, you aren't alone. One of America's biggest industrialists has openly admitted, I am afraid. Every man is afraid. Prosperity is just around the corner, say the hopeful headlines. But around the corners wind the lengthening bread lines, and a whole new class of citizens appears in American society, the new poor. And when private charity can no longer carry the burden, the states are forced to act. The New York governor, Franklin Roosevelt, is the first to supply direct emergency relief to the unemployed. The same paralysis that lames the cities blights the farms. And out in the country, too, men are asking, what's wrong? What's happening? Farm prices have dropped disastrously, and a man's work no longer brings him a just return. The threat of foreclosure, of losing house and home, spreads through the conservative farmlands, and radical talk is boiling into action. The Farmers Holiday Association organizes to block the flow of farm product to the city in an attempt to force prices up. It is illegal action. But one farmer says, seems to me there was a tea party in Boston that was illegal too.
crisis spreads. From all over the country, unemployed veterans of World War I march on Washington, 15,000 of them. They demand immediate payment of a cash bonus promised them for the future. They need it now. They want it now. But the Senate votes no, and authorities see in the bonus marchers a mob animated by the spirit of revolution, a menace to the nation's capital. Troops disperse the veterans and burn down their shanty settlement. Since the Civil War has such pressure, political, economic, social, centered on the White House. In the face of a hostile press and a divided Congress, Herbert Hoover makes unprecedented use of government power to encourage recovery. But his fundamental faith is in the rugged individualism of the American people and in private enterprise. Economic depression, he says, cannot be cured by legislative action. The basic causes of the deepening crisis remain stubbornly obscure even to the business leaders summoned to the White House. The explanation offered by humorist Robert Benchley is as good as any. Now, what were the primary causes of the depression, as we called it? Overproduction, maladjustments in gold distribution, overproduction, deflation, too little thyroid secretion, or Platt's disease, too much vermouth, overproduction, and by the same token, underproduction. Then too, there was the Gulf Stream. All of these helped lead to inflation, deflation, and overproduction, with a consequent depression. Many are beyond joking. A report from Detroit says men are sitting in the parks all day long, out of work, muttering to themselves. Some succumb to apathy. Some are swept by alarm, and bank after bank across the country is hit by panic withdrawals. New lines appear on American streets, depositors swarming to snatch out what savings they have left before it's too late. Banks by the hundreds, by the thousands, are forced to close. On the eve of the presidential election of 1932, the whole financial system quakes and totters. A bitter electorate of frightened people turns overwhelmingly against the party in power, turns hopefully toward a new national leader, Franklin D. Roosevelt. His campaign promise, a new deal. His campaign song, happy days are here again. Franklin Delano Roosevelt on his inauguration day. In the tension and antagonisms of the moment, the defeated president and the president-to-be barely speak as they ride together to the Capitol for the swearing-in ceremony. The day is overcast and sullen, shadowed by uncertainty in Washington and throughout the land. For America, something is ending this day. Something is beginning, and no man can tell what. One thing only is certain on this 4th of March, 1933. The old order changeth, yielding place to new. From the 32nd president of the United States in his inaugural address come words that electrify a people desperate for hope and assurance. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Whatever may be said of him, this the people sense. He is not afraid.
Interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. And what is your need? An overcoat? Yes. Excellent. Yes. Heavy weight? Or like weight? Heavy weight. 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 Heavy now, what do you think of me as a tailor? Ah, I got you well. They couldn't do any better on Bayard or Baxter Street. Look out that the tin pan market doesn't get it. Now, a muffler in color, you. Your eyes sparkle. You don't want any special color? No gloves. Doesn't make any difference to you. Well, all right, then. You have this muffler, and I'll put it around your neck. There. And anything else that you need? Anything else that you need? No. You've got everything you need. Yes. And you'll feel happy that way? Yes. Have you had a turkey dinner? Yes. And you feel better? Yes. And you'll be able to do or Do you work? Yes. What kind of work do you do? I, 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 oh, you carry a sign. You're a sandwich man. Oh, you've been oiling automobiles. I taking care of them. Oh, you, oh, you get hit by an automobile and you haven't been able to do anything. And you're a sandwich man. How much do you earn a week, a month? 
Will you speak so that I can hear you? Yes, sir. Oh, now there's the voice. You'll be the sweet singer, the first thing I know. Yes. And right, you get uh, you get work only one day a week. Yes, sir. How much does that give you? Two dollars and a half. Two dollars and a half. Where do you sleep? Well, I have to sleep cheap places. Cheap places. How much do you pay? A quarter a night. Sir. A quarter a night. You yes. can't go far on that. No, sir. Does the tub help you by having a fair five cent yes, meal? Sir. That yes. carries you through? Yes, sir. And with a little bit of clothing yes, and some economy yes, and sleeping on the floor once in a while yes. and carrying the banner we call? No, I don't. You don't walk the streets, eh? No, not very well. I'd rather save my money and pay for something. Oh, I see. You'd rather save your money and pay, sir, for something to sleep. And now you'll feel happier? Yes. And you'll carry your sandwich yes, uh, profession yes. with greater proficiency? That's good. Now <laughs> go forth, my friends, and be happy. We're gonna put that sun back in the sky. We're gonna put that sun back in the sky. When we put that sun, when we put that sun, when we put that sun back in the sky. We're gonna put that smile back on each face. We're gonna put that smile back on each face. When we put that smile, when we put that smile, when we put that smile back on your face. We're gonna put that sun back in the sky. We're gonna put that sun back in the sky. When we put that sun, when we put that sun, when we put that sun back in the sky. We're gonna put that smile back on your face. We're gonna put that smile back on your face. When we put that smile, when we put that smile, when we put that smile back on your face. Wah, wah, wah. Sing a little cool little tune, wah, wah, wah. That's what we want under the moon. Gotta put that sun back in the sky. Got teeth those bluebirds, how to fly to make it. I love you, song of each blue song, just as the time goes by and by.
Can anything be more ridiculous than the white man's country now? You say that the country has lots of wheat, lots of corn, lots of cotton, lots of wool, immense stores of everything. But there's bread lines all over the country. The people are going hungry and they're shabbily dressed. Why don't you live like the Indians? The Indian either had depression all the time or we don't know what depression is. Those who have immense stores of all of these things stored in, they can't use them. And those who have not any, they cannot get them. Isn't that a funny way for this country to be with its people? And when the Indian steals 15 cents, the white man has already stole 15 millions and more. And that is not all. If the Indian is caught doing these things, he is either hanged or jailed for it. But when the white man is caught, he's brought before the high tribunal and given a good lecture, and so he'll be more careful and not get caught the next time. The white man worships the god of greed. He invented the, the alarm clock and is now a slave to it. Everything he does, he does according to the clock. He gets up by the clock, he eats by the clock, he works by the clock and goes to bed by the clock. He, he is a slave entirely to the clock. The Indian life is different. The Indian lives as he chooses out in the open air. He does the thing that he likes to do and he does them when he wants them done. The white man spends two-thirds of his life chasing the almighty dollar. By the time he's accumulated his fortune and his millions, he's so old that he doesn't enjoy them no more. He would gladly trade all his millions for a few years more, which he could have very well gotten them had he kept within the right that the great spirit had made him to do. Then his money is gone, his friends is gone, everybody is gone, and he is afraid of tomorrow. We invite you to come out west into our country from your nerve-wrecking cities and live the life that we were born to live and not live an artificial life like you live in the city. We want you to come and breathe the same pure air that we breathe, the mountain air, the rivers, the fish in our streams, and live the happy and contented life that the Great Spirit intended the Indians to live forever. We invite you to come to this country. <laughs> this is Santiago Quintano of the Pueblo of Cochiti, New Mexico. He has made two trips to California on foot, and if he lives five years more, he will be a hundred years old. Hello, Kaimat, Katanit, Kaimat, Sio Akasta. To Hasta. He says this Santiago Quintana has lived three generations, and whatever this man has said, it's all true.
dance endurance contest started on Friday of April 11th. And here it is, August 1st, and there are still three and one half teams left on the floor. Out of the original 50 teams that started out in this grind on Friday of April 11th. That means that this time these three and one half teams have been on the floor 2,664 hours. Figure that out for yourself. It's 111 days, 15 weeks, and six days. At 10.30 of this day, they will have broken the old world's record for dance endurance by 863 hours, 38 and one half minutes. The world recently has repeatedly given evidence of a liking for sports and activities of an endurance nature. Just a minute, a klaxon will sound sending group number two over there to their cots on the east end of the floor for one of their short five minute rest periods. The contestants receive quite a bit of attention from the attendants, trainers, and nurses while they take this short five minute rest. Here we are dancing 24 hours daily at White City, Chicago, in the world's greatest marathon. It originally started here at the White City Ballroom with 126 couples on August the 30th of last year. These dancers are on the floor constantly, 24 hours a day, taking 10 minute rest period. They're finding considerable difficulty keeping their feet in shape, but they're still going. Not very strong, but nevertheless, still going. And that's the main thing in a marathon contest. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to have you meet one of the original couples here in the White City Ballroom Marathon in Chicago that started on August the 30th of last year, Frankie Wagner and Buddy Plasky. How do you feel, Frankie? Oh, I feel pretty tired. And after going about five months, why, we all feel tired, but we hope to win. Well, and they ain't gonna, they ain't gonna, we ain't gonna walk off this club until they pull us off. Well, how's Betty? Oh, Betty, she's asleep, but I'll wake her up and say a few words. Betty, Betty! Wake up! Oh, Five. what month is this? Oh, I guess it's January, about 26. Oh, see. Oh. Well? You feeling tired? How's your hot puppies today? Oh, they feel like hot dogs. Well, you think we can stick it out, Frankie? Oh, you betcha. We're going to anyway till the end. Well, I hope so anyway. Gee, it's getting tougher every day. I want this dancing to end.
the bulls operating on the stock exchange, the elections mean four more years of prosperity. Americans have become fearless speculators, living in a make-believe world, getting rich quick without working. As Mr. Coolidge turns over the reins of government to Mr. Hoover, he announces that things are absolutely sound and stocks are cheap at current prices. Don't sell America short. Why, man, we've scarcely started. From Boston to San Francisco, the bull market is the national mania, the biggest news of the day, every day, coast to coast. And what quotation? Steel up, utilities up, motors up, radio way up, everything up, up, up. What difference does it make if you buy a railroad stock such as Seaboard Airline and think it is an aviation corporation as long as it goes up? Buy on margin. Brokers loans are available. All you have to do is have five cents for a telephone call, and you can even get that on credit. Just buy. Buy on margin. Everyone is doing it, and everybody is getting rich. Why not? Everything is going one way, and one way only. Up, 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 and up. Production, sales, bank deposits, broker's loans, stocks, especially broker's loans and stocks. Up. Even the Illuminati dropped Freud in favor of electric bond and share. Let's do it. Let's do it. Birds do it. Bees do it. Even educated fleas do it. The bulls are loose and pawing the ground. Four million shares a day, five million, six, seven, that's nothing. Nothing can arrest the upward movement, say the oracles. And the Secretary of the Treasury has predicted the high tide of prosperity will continue. What more do you want? 300 million shares are being carried on margin. Brokers' loans are at an all-time high. But don't worry, the values must be there somewhere. The market is not only discounting the future, it's discounting the hereafter. Everything's the flea's eyebrows, the snake's hips, and I don't mean maybe. Americans are rolling in the stuff. It's only money. There's cream in every cup of coffee, plenty of salt in every stew, and never have so many had so much of both. But their habit for me, you will always be my necessity. I'd be lost without you. Boom on Wall Street, Bonanza on Park Avenue, binge on Broadway. Another season, another reason for making whoopee. the sax, the beat of the drum, new notes, rising notes, and the screech of the times comes from a speakeasy queen. Hello, sucker!
September 1929, soaring out into the wild blue yonder, stocks hit what looks like a permanently high plateau. Now here's a tip. Some of these prices will look ridiculously low in a year or two. New York swelters in a severe heat wave, but that doesn't stop anybody. Sure, there are technical readjustments once in a while, as the lunatic fringe of margin speculators is being shaken out, but conditions are fundamentally sound, aren't they? October, Indian summer, 1929. The day has come. Not so gradually, not so slowly. The market goes up a little, then it goes down a lot. In the decade of bad taste, in the revolution of manners and morals, the bears finally jump the bulls. It's over, all over, over here, here in Wall Street. The oracle still sound off, a technical readjustment, and the market rallies. Stocks always go up, don't they? Down go the common stocks. Down, down, down they go. Tuesday, October 29th, 1929, in history's worst panic, over 16 million shares are dumped on the market. Over $14 billion go with them, and so goes the confidence of a nation. Wall Street lays an egg, and so do the 20s. The greatest gaudiest spree in history is over. The people have had one too many. Margin, more margin, there isn't any more margin. Hallelujah. The jazz age is over, all over. that Wall Street has shorn. When I was a little girl, a patron of art left me a million dollars for my musical education. But I thought I couldn't live on the income from a million dollars. So I asked all my rich friends for tips on the market. They gave them to me and I lost my million. Now the only thing I have left is this chinchilla coat of mine which I paid $25,000 for. And are there any bears in the house? If there are, I wish you'd buy my coat. From now on, my hands are off the ticker and on the piano keys. And my advice to you is that if you're lucky enough to have a million dollars, hold everything. And above all, don't play the stock market.
this is his forever mower. It'll never wear out. And it grand. Look at it. What are you doing, Fanny? Knitting a sweater. Who's it for? For the unemployed, my relations, all my uncles. Not one of them are working. One more stitch and I'll be even. Now, all kidding aside, folks, this is really a serious matter. And I've asked all these girls from the Sweet Low Company to knit sweaters for the unemployed. Poor unemployed who haven't got enough money to sell apples. And by the way, I might win a prize. You know, the New York American is offering $100 for the best sweater. Don't you think it's a dandy? I think it's a dandy, ain't you? I think I'll be grabbing up the first prize. Uncomplaining, they fought the worst drought in history. Their stock choked to death on the barren land. Their homes were nightmares of swirling dust, night and day. Many went ahead of them, but many stayed. Until stock, machinery, homes, credit, food, and even hope were gone. to the west. Once again, they headed for the setting sun. Thank you. 
once again they headed west. Last year, in every summer month, 30,000 people left the Great Plains and hit the highways for the Pacific coast, the last border. Blown out, baked out, and broke. Nothing to stay for, nothing to hope for. Homeless, penniless, and bewildered, they joined the great army of the highway. No place to go, and no place to stop. Nothing to eat, nothing to do. Their homes on four wheels, their work, a desperate gamble for a day's labor in the fields along the highway. The price of a sack of beans or a tank of gas. All they ask is a chance to start over and a chance for their children to eat, to have medical care, to have homes again. 30,000 a month, the sun and winds wrote the most tragic chapter in American agriculture. to Baton Rouge, Baton Rouge to Natchez, Natchez to Vicksburg, Vicksburg to Memphis, Memphis to Cairo. A thousand miles down the levee, the long vigil starts. 38 feet at Baton Rouge, river rising. Helen, river rising. Memphis, river rising. Cairo, river rising. A thousand miles to go, a thousand miles of levee to hold. Coast Guard patrol needed at Paducah. Coast Guard patrol needed at Paducah. 200 boats wanted at Hickman. 200 boats wanted at Hickman. Levee patrol, men to Blytheville. Levee patrol, men to Blytheville. Two thousand men wanted at Cairo. Two thousand men wanted at Cairo. A hundred thousand men to fight the old river. We sent every branch of the service down the river to help the sleepless engineers fight a battle on a two thousand mile front. The Army and the Navy, the Coast Guard and the Marine Corps, the CCC and the WPA, the Red Cross and the Health Service fought night and day to hold the old river off the valley. needed at Louisville, 500 dead, 5,000 ill. Food and water needed at Cincinnati. Food and medicine needed at Lawrenceburg. 35,000 homeless in Evansville. Food and medicine needed in Aurora. Food and medicine and shelter and clothing for 750,000 down in the valley. Last time, we held the levee, but the Mississippi claimed her valley. She backed into Tennessee and Arkansas and Illinois and Missouri. She spread her arms over thousands of acres of land, and she left farms ruined, stock drowned, houses torn loose. Nineteen three, 
1907, 1913, 1916, 1922, 1937. We built a hundred cities and a thousand towns, but at what a cost. Far-reaching indeed are the effect uh, of the slump in the stock uh, market, for it has reached even the Bowery from Chatham Square to Cooper Square. And those that have been living uh, in the Bowery and at the tub eating have been uh, today dispossessed of that property, the tub. There is no doubt that the carpenter was right that the poor we always have among us, and that usually they are in the open air. We are uh, being uh, dispossessed and moving back to 33 St. Mark's Place, where are the headquarters of the old Bucks and Lone Lame Ducks Club here. And there we shall continue our service as in the past. Feeding men at 33 St. Mark's Place, the tub, from five in the morning until seven at night. From five until 10 oatmeal with all the coffee they can drink and all the bread they can eat. Then so on, from 10 until seven, thick soup. Not dish water, but thick soup. And all the bread they can eat and all the coffee they can drink. For those who are naked, we will clothe them. For those who are famished for fellowship, we shall give them friendship. And for those who are without shelter, as far as we can, we'll shelter them as long as we can. Not until the beginning of the works program was it possible to initiate a general plan for the development of farm-to-market roads. This plan brings immediate improvement in local business and property values wherever a secondary road is completed. At last, the farmer finds it possible to reach his market over well-constructed, weatherproof roads. In all these construction projects, local labor is employed, and wherever possible, the raw materials are obtained from quarries in the immediate vicinity. How big is the WPA road program? In its first 18 months of operation, the mileage end to end would have stretched five times around the earth. In many parts of the country are regions which depend largely upon the tourists' trade as a local industry. Areas of great scenic beauty have been made available to thousands of visitors through the development of systems of roads in national and state parks and at other centers of attraction for tourists. Many of these vacation spots were completely inaccessible before the assistance of the works program made road construction possible. The welfare of the community served by a new construction project is always the first consideration and plans are laid not only for the present but for the more demanding future. In the field of public health, many important and permanent improvements have been undertaken. The water resources of thousands of cities and towns have been expanded by the construction of reservoirs and water supply systems, ensuring an adequate supply of water for the community's needs for many years to come. A particularly interesting example of a long-felt need met by the works program is this reservoir at Atlantic City. Although this resort entertains millions of visitors every year, it never has had an adequate water supply until this reservoir was built. Another type of permanent construction is this community stadium, representative of a large group of projects that provide facilities for public gatherings all over America. Thank you. 
In cooperation with other federal agencies, many important improvements have been made under the works program at the Brooklyn Navy Yard and other centers of government activity. As an aid to traffic, hundreds of new bridges have been completed, designed to withstand high waters and the pounding of heavy loads. Thousands of other bridges have been repaired and made safe. Many cities have been freed from the peril of disease by the provision of modern, scientific, correct sewage systems, which often replace antiquated systems entirely inadequate for the needs of the community. Developments such as these are always undertaken with the cooperation of the public health agencies serving each locality, and the projects are carried out under the supervision of competent sanitary engineers. In the larger cities, where the concentration of population is greatest, slum clearance projects have been undertaken. In some areas, new modern housing developments will be erected, providing better living conditions for workers in the low-income groups. In other locations, the land cleared will be used for public parks and playgrounds. In all parts of the country, the letters WPA are a symbol of progress and improvement. On buildings under construction, they mean the replacement of inadequate public facilities by new, well-planned structures. On buildings under repair, they mean the preservation of existing structures for greater utility. Many thousands of such jobs as these dot the map of the United States, giving work and hope to people who can't find jobs, impetus to retail trade and heavy industry, and permanent improvements to a host of communities for the years to come. Another example of useful employment is found in the sewing rooms operated by the works program in practically every city in the country. Expert craftsmanship is encouraged in design groups associated with the sewing projects. Women who are the principal support of their families are paid for their work, and the millions of garments and miscellaneous articles they produce are distributed free to families on relief or to tax-supported institutions. For some of the women who work in these sewing rooms, the training and practical experience they receive will not only make them better housewives, but it may also open up avenues to a permanent source of income. Many other types of employment are provided for women. In a number of weaving projects, instruction is given in an interesting and useful craft. Painters, too, contribute their bit to making the works program a real and permanent accomplishment. These reproductions of the American scene of today will make this one of the most fertile periods of our country's art. Some of this work is done on canvas, but much of it is created on the walls of our schools, libraries, and other public buildings in the form of mural paintings. Of particular interest is the great mural in the mess hall of the Military Academy at West Point, depicting great warriors of history. An art long dormant in the United States is the creation of stained glass windows. One project devoted to this art has made a window for the military academy at West Point depicting scenes from the life of Washington. Commemorative tablets like this are among the contributions of sculptors to the works program and they also create works of art for our parks and public buildings. Many American museums have long been in need of highly skilled experts to restore valuable historical material, such as this Persian ceiling, which is forming under the deft fingers of a WPA artist in the Philadelphia Museum. In many other museums, fossils and animal skeletons are being prepared and mounted for study. Only a few years ago, we were a discouraged people because we were the first to lose our jobs when old man depression came along and the last to get them back. We struggled vainly to regain our bearings while depression, fear and failure stalked the nation. A tenth of the population of the United States we formed as a race over a sixth of the unemployed. One out of every four of us was on relief. In vain, we sought for something to restore our confidence, our hope, our courage. Without jobs, we had no money. And without money, we could not purchase food for the hungry dogs at home. Our only hope lay in charity. Hunger drove our people to the bread lines. Anxiously, we waited, waited for some sign of better days. Then came the federal government's work program. One by one, it took us out of the bread line. 
It gave us a new chance to take a normal place in the life of our community. It made us self-supporting. It changed the haggard, hopeless faces of the bread line into faces filled with hope and happiness, for now we work again. Unskilled laborers, the forgotten men of past generations, now work steadily at decent wages. The nation over, they're building and repairing schools, public buildings, community centers, and airports to meet the changing needs of our modern world. In one project at the nation's capital, 1,200 men are employed in improving bowling fields, grading, constructing runways, building hangars, and administration buildings. In addition to the hundreds of unskilled laborers who were removed from relief rolls, many skilled workers are employed in this important improvement project. Hundreds of homes have been freed from the bondage of poverty as their breadwinners find security and hope in their new jobs. In New York City, a WPA housing demolition project is underway, which will greatly improve the living conditions of families of moderate means. In many other cities of the country, old tenements and fire traps are being torn down to make way for modern buildings containing comfortable sanitary apartments. At Colonial Park in Harlem, as in many other congested areas, WPA workers have constructed a huge swimming pool and are now completing a bathhouse which will accommodate 4,100 persons. In this construction project, skilled workers are employed, utilizing the knowledge of their trades gained in the days before depression. Just because I'm I, our lives will come together without a tear or sigh. And though the years roll slowly by, you'll find I'll ever be true. Just because I'm I, sweetheart, about you. Are you? Oh. Oh, that's so. You did say you'd come back today, didn't you? Could you give us a few more days? My husband's out in a wonderful prospect, and besides, one of my relatives is coming here tonight, and I'm certain he'll be able to help us in some way. I'm positive everything will be all right in two or three days. Old man Godski's getting pretty sore at you delinquent tenants, but I'll try and stall him off for a day after tomorrow. But that'll be the limit. If your hubby can't dig up some money by then, well, you'd better have your bags packed when I come back. Thank you so much, Mr. Crumb. I'm certain we'll be able to dig up some money by then. Well, goodbye. Was that Hoosus I saw going down the stairs? He gave us till day after tomorrow. How'd you make out? Same old story. A hundred guys and only one job. <laughs> I seem to be getting nowhere fast. John, Uncle Anthony's in town. He called up today and I got the bright idea to ask him here for dinner. There's a chance he might give you a job. Oh, what did you do that for? We can get along without him. Well, a job's a job, no matter where it comes from. Well, we still got two days. I'll figure out something by then. Come on, let's figure out where we're going to get a chicken for dinner. Well, why a chicken? Can't your uncle eat hamburgers as well as I can? He can, but he's not going to tonight. Well, how are we going to get a chicken? The same way we've been getting the hamburger. Now, run along. We have a lot of things left. Well, anything to keep peace in the family. Oh, 
okay by me. <laughs> Hello, Schultz, old boy. Hello. How about a chicken on credit until day after tomorrow? Oh, that's what you told me two months ago. Not another bean. Cash on the table. What's the idea? What, what am I running? A delicatessen or, or a pawn shop? Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> what you're trying to promote these days, John? Believe it or not, the only thing I'm trying to promote is a job. Well, I'm glad to see you're getting some sense in your head. Just try standing in line for three hours with a hundred other guys, waiting for one measly job. Mm -hmm. What's happened to the old big shot here? Get rich quick Johnny, the oil well promoter. Sounds like he's come down to earth, huh? <laughs> oh, he uh -huh. has. Mm -hmm. He's tried awfully hard, haven't you? Now, that's fine. Can't you do something for him, Uncle? Let me think. You know, I'm no different than anybody else. I've been hit, too, plenty. And John, I never was strong for outright charity. And I don't think any different today. I don't want any favors, Uncle. All I want is a chance to work. Listen to him, Doc. Eh? <laughs> You been reading the papers lately? You know, back to the land, all that sort of stuff? Yeah. Sounds like the only answer. Look, here's a letter from the bank about the mortgage on a piece of land I own, a farm, that at present values is worth practically nothing. Bank don't want it, neither do I. Gonna let it go. But it might mean something to you, for a while anyway. Then, of course, there's always the chance you might make the darn thing pay and get the bank to hold on. How's it strike you? Why, Uncle Anthony. That's darn nice of you. You know, I could write a book on what I don't know about farming. But I guess beggars can't be choosers. Would I have an even break to make the thing go? That's up to you. What do you say, Mary? Oh, anything's better than fighting off bill collectors day after day. If it suits you, it's okay by me. Have, have you got a map? Uh, will you write out the directions? How far away is it? When can we go? Well, about 180 miles south of here, there's a town by the name of Arcadia. You drive right down through the main stem. Turn to the left, go maybe six miles. Not bad, huh? A rent collector would have a hard time finding this place. Thank goodness. Look, a windmill. You know what that's for? To tell which way the wind blows. Yeah. No, what are you talking about? I suppose you think that's a mule. Well, he had a mule for a father, didn't he? Or a mother, which is it? Neither. Or both. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and the house, too. I thought your uncle might have been kidding about the house. <laughs> fireplace. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
fool yet. Hey, why don't you put the axle over that hole there and then shove the jack under? Thanks, that's a good idea. <laughs> That's a good yoke, all right. I fixed the tire to go, and I got this much gas only. <laughs> I'd like to help you out, but I haven't got any gas here. You going far? I was going to California, Pen Gold, maybe. But I don't think I get there now. That's tough, all right. Where'd you start from? I was a farmer in Minnesota, but they take my farm away. Yeah, it's been pretty hard on you guys. Say, I'll bet you know all about farming. I always think so, till last couple years. How would you like to come in here and work this place with me? I just got here yesterday myself, and I don't know much about this farming racket. Say, fella, you joking? Honest, no joking. Come on, I'll open the gate. See how she goes? Water makes ground just like chocolate cake. Say, that's wonderful. I'd sure like some sardines tonight for a change. I haven't had any since last night. Oh, hello there. Hello. Hilda, my wife, say maybe you like come eat hot rabbit stew? Oh, we'll be right over. Thanks very much. You are welcome. Say, how's that, huh? Well, the next time you want rabbit stew, you use fix a wire like this and a loop like this and here comes the rabbit, clonk, 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 bing, and he's catched. <laughs> <laughs> and if I don't get him, I stop him so. Well, can you imagine that? Wonderful. And those carrots was on the other end of these weeds you cut down yesterday. Oh, John. You mean I cut... Y you are sure? <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you know about that? Carrots grow on weeds. <laughs> no. <laughs> I was just thinking how much that sweet is done in one day. There must be a lot of fellas in the same boat, just driving someplace until they run out of gas. Look, if one man can do as much as he has in one day, well, why wouldn't ten men do ten times as much? You know, a, a plumber, a carpenter, a stonemason, a sort of cooperative community. Where money isn't so important. You help me, I help you. Great idea, huh? If it suits you, it's okay by me. Dozens of them, John. Look. Whoa. <laughs> Come on, Napoleon. Line up, men. What's your trade? Barber? Can't use you. How about you? I'm a cigar salesman. 
What can you do? High class pants pressing. This is a farm, not a hotel. Plumber. Whoa, that's something. Carpenter. No kidding. I'm a police violinist. Listen, I can do anything else. Can do anything. Now, look, I'll be back to you guys. Keep your places. It won't do you any good to rush me. Don't you know a trade? Uh, can you fix a machine, uh, till the soil? Uh, can you use your hands? I can use nothing but my hands, but only to make music. Yeah, well, you see, we're building up a... Uh, Please give me a chance. I have strong wrists, strong fingers. I'll learn. Oh, let me stay in work. I'll do anything. Don't go away, partner. Thank you. I'm a stonemason. Okay! Yeah, thank mister, you. Mister, mister, I'll till the soil. I'll sow seed. I'll sow anything. What can you do? What's to be done? Well, did you read the sign? We're looking for men skilled in basic trades like uh, farmers, carpenters, mechanics. Have you got a tractor? Well, you can call it that. I'll drive the tractor. Uh, do you know anything about farming? I said I'd drive the tractor. Mister, listen. Listen, you got to listen to me. Please. I'm going to have a baby any day now. What's that? <laughs> Not me. My wife in the car. Well, why didn't you tell me <laughs> so? Hey, Mary, he's going to have a baby. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'm an undertaker. When Captain John Smith and his gang arrived on this continent, what did they do? Stand around and beef about the unemployment situation or value of the dollar? No. They set to work to make their own employment, build their own houses and grow their own food. On the Mayflower, there was a, a planter. A printer, a doctor, a soldier, a bookkeeper, and so on. And that's what we've got here. If they got along without landlords and grocery bills, so can we. What we've got to do is help ourselves by helping others. We've got the land, and we've got the strength. Yeah, and we haven't got any Indians coming around to scalp us, either. <laughs> <laughs> now, you don't have to stay. You can go whenever you want to. But if you do stay, make up your minds to work and put this thing over. Folks, I've got two bushels of potatoes in the back of my flivver. I suggest that we throw everything we have in together into one common pot. Money, food, everything. You can have my three ends and a rooster. I got a $20 gold piece. I got two sacks of flour. I'll throw in my goat. And here's my 560. Post for a dollar eighty. <laughs> marvelous, marvelous. All right, you, uh, a man with the potatoes, uh, what's your name? Hannibal, George Washington Hannibal. All right, Hannibal, you're a commissary sergeant. Accepted with pleasure, sir. <laughs> now, uh, who had that $20 gold piece? Here it is. You've got charge of the dough, the uh, finances, if any. OK. Mr. Chairman and friends, what form of government are we going to have? Well, uh, uh, whatever most of the crowd wants. Then I suggest, my friends, that we bind ourselves together in sacred covenant and establish an immortal democracy. Ah. 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 Well, it was that kind of talk that got us here in the first place. <laughs> no. We must have a socialistic form of government. The government must control everything, including the profits. Wait a minute. Let me talk. I don't even know what those words mean them fellas been talking. All I know is we got a big job here and we need a big boss. And Jan Sims is fella for boss. Yeah. Sims for boss. Yeah. Hip hip. Hooray!
work begins. It's from dawn to dusk and after. That's the way things are on the farm. Summer and winter go by. It may be dark in the barn, but you've got to milk just the same. It may be hot or cold, but the feed has to go to the cattle. A farmer works at a dozen trades through the day, and so does his wife and his sons and his daughters. For Bill Parkinson, the long day's work has begun. Everybody has to help. If you marry a farmer, that's the first thing you learn. And winter go by, but the water has to be pumped and the fire lighted. This is 1940, but the farm woman's day is long. They don't complain, the women like Hazel Parkinson, but they know on an August morning how hot the stove was going to be at noon. They may not say much about it, but they wish you could just turn a faucet to get your water the way you can in town. They know, and their children know, the work that goes into raising food for a nation. from the dairy. Fresh milk goes to town. But this hot day, there's something wrong. Sour milk, good for pigs, but not for human beings. It's hard to cool milk right in August if you haven't the right sort of pump or equipment. Milk today must pass modern standards, dairy standards. Sour milk, good for pigs, but the milk check won't be so big this month. Wash day in the women's work. Seven people make a big wash, but it's gotta be done every week. You can't leave your men folks dirty, they might get used to it. Heat the water, carry the water, pour it in the tub. Every week, just like cleaning the lamps. That's the old way, the hard way. Yes, there is a machine to do the wash, but it runs by electricity. There are lamps you don't have to clean and trim and fill, but they run by electricity. Here on the farm where it's needed most, electricity is hard to get. Power companies want a profit. They get it in the city where people are scrunched up together but the farms are left in the dark. Three farms out of four are left in the dark. 75% of all farms in this big inventive country. Seems wrong somehow.
The wash is up on the line. It took till now. Only there's still the ironing to be done. Roll her in. Roll her in and rest her. Yes, that's a good load. A good load. A first class load. And the shadows turning east and growing. Light, the light of 70 years ago before electricity was born. The lamp and stove were good tools in their day, but there are better ones now. Good people, hardworking people, deserve the best tools man can make. Bless this food to this family. They have earned it, not by easy tasks, but with their strength and their toil. They're wise in the ways of the earth. They are a united family. Now they're tired at the end of day, but they're friendly with each other, glad to see each other's faces. They may not say very much, but they have the word home in their hearts. The things we cherish most in America are here at this table. While we foster and maintain them, it shall be well with all of us. in quietude, but the day's work is not. lamplight and homework. The capital of Illinois is Springfield and the capital of Nebraska is Lincoln. But the letters and words to tired eyes blur and dance on the page. She doesn't care so much about her own eyes, but her children's has to have a good edge for tomorrow's mowing. Wouldn't be so hard if you had a good light on your work. Wouldn't be so hard with power to turn the grindstone. They found that out in the cities, in the factories. But one man can't change that alone. Now they talk it over, the country way, 
the slow, cautious decision of the people. Electricity, about time we got around here. Well, it sure would help me out, and the woman too. But the power company says, you can see their lines go cross country, see them in the sky, but they don't bring the power down to the farm. Say it costs too much. Say a lot of things. I'd sure like to light up the barn and the house too. Running water. Ellen's always saying, if we had running water, power company won't do it. But I hear there's a new kind of power, government. That's right. I hear there's an agency, rural electrification. Well, now, how do you go about it? I, I ain't for it, but I'm ready to be convinced. I'm for it if it gets us the power. Uh, why don't we get a meeting, a meeting and hear about it, find out about it. Don't have to take it unless we want, but find out about it. Government power for our farms. One night in the district schoolhouse, Bill Parkinson's neighbors get together. They listen and argue and ask questions. They speak their mind. Some are not easy to convince. What's it going to cost? Who's going to run it? Why is the government doing it? Who's going to own the lines? The county agent meets them on their own ground. The REA was set up by the president and the Congress in 1935 to help farmers to get the power and light at a price they can afford. The REA loans money at low interest rates for line construction and, where necessary, for generating plants to the cooperative set up by the farmers in the community. There are no private investors, no profit making. You don't risk any cash yourself except a small membership fee. You get power at cost. When the loan from the government to your cooperative is paid back through your electric bills, you and your neighbors will own your own electric system, your own lines. place that always had power. Now, wires swing out to the country. They're stretching out, long wires reaching out where wires never went before. There's a tune as the wind blows through the wires. Power for the Parkinson's. They're lifting the pole. Back in revolutionary days in this country, we used to plant a pole and call it a liberty tree. This pole has been a liberty tree to thousands of farm families. Hoist up the transformer. It means kilowatt hours of electricity. One kilowatt hour will do a week's wash. We'll grind 100 pounds of grain. One kilowatt hour will hoist two tons of hay. Kilowatt hours don't get tired.
Bill Parkinson is now a member of the Belmont Electric Cooperative. I didn't know a stove could look as clean as that. Looks as if it would bake good, too. Thursday, August the 8th, 1940, southwestern Ohio. Scattered showers and thunderstorms tonight and Friday. Cooler Friday afternoon and night. Much cooler in southwest portions of the state. Here's your weather forecast. The United States weather... Electricity means running water on the farm. You can throw the old pump handle away. This pump works all the time for a few cents a day. Clean ice. No worry about things souring and spoiling in summer. farmers read their own meters. Well, that may sound queer to the people in the city, but in a cooperative, if you tried to cheat, you'd only be cheating yourself. Fresh milk, clean milk for the town, cooled by the running water. No returns from the dairy, no more milk that should have fed the children gone to the pigs. Come on, fellas, we got an electric mama now. A turn of the hand means drinking water for the horses. A turn of the hand instead of minutes at the pump.
big week's wash, but it won't ache any woman's back. No bending over the scrub board, no rubbing and scrubbing while your arms and fingers ache. first thing women ask for after light itself. If you have ever ironed for an hour, you'll know why. An electric iron may not look important to a man, but it lightens one whole day's burden for a woman. Missouri even taught her ringer how to shell peas. I won't ask for an affidavit on that, but she says it's true. We've got the power from the high lines now. It'll help us out through night and day. And we've got new tools for the old toil. We'll learn their ways and set them to work. Set them to work to help us all. Neighbors working together. We hired the money and brought the wires. It's our own power and our own light, and it will belong to all of us, all of us here together. It's a friendly sound when the motor whirs it's a friendly sight when the lights go on. It's the light and power we've never had, but we've got it now together. And long day ends. Things will be easier now. <laughs> 